Okay. Here is a demonstration of how we do the thermal analysis of construction materials, concrete, stucco, cement, mortar, historic mortar. Thermal analysis is a very important technique to determine different uh, minerals present in the material which uh, decomposes at characteristic temperatures and when it decomposes either it decomposes by dehydration of hydrous minerals or decarbonation of carbonate minerals at their characteristic temperature we determine the change in the mass, change in the weight of the material from decomposition and from that we determine the amount of the material, amount of the mineral present in the in the in the concrete or mortar or cement. So this is a very powerful technique to do quantitative analysis of different hydrous sulfate carbonate phases present in in the material. So we do this thermal analysis by using a metal Toledo's TGA DSC1 unit shown here. It's a very powerful unit to do TGA or thermogravimetric analysis and it also does DSC differential scanning calorimetry simultaneously on the same sample we can de determine the weight change from decomposition at different temperature by TGA as well as the energy, the heat energy absorbed by differential scanning calorimetry. This unit comes with a robot so we can do multiple samples analysis at the same time. We actually can place in this robot up to 34 samples, we can load 34 samples and it will determine the TGA and DSC scan of samples one after other unattended. To do thermal analysis we take powder sample very small amount of the powder sample in different crucibles. So let me turn on the machine and I'll show you a run. This machine will come with a gas controller which controls the gas. We have pure nitrogen gas which comes from here. This is the tank which gives the ultra pure nitrogen. That is ultra pure nitrogen is used as a parched gas and that gas comes to this inlet where the gas comes to flush the system with ultra pure nitrogen and this gas controller controls the gas coming in and this also comes with a sample press and this sample press is used if we want to use aluminium crucible for aluminium crucible we use this this sample press but most of the time we use alumina L203 alumina crucible where we can do both TGA and DSC simultaneously so to turn on the system, the switch on the back, both the gas controller and the main unit, we turn on together. So when the switch turns on, the screen, this is a touch screen, which turns on. It goes to checking the configuration. And it's going to tell the balance is start up. Once the balance starts up, it shows the temperature and the mass in milligram. And pretty soon it will say software not found because we haven't started the software to run the metal Toledo's TGA DSC unit. This side is the balance and this side is the furnace. This furnace moves back and forth, opens and closes and the sample goes inside the sensor. There are two types of sensors, actually there are three types of sensors this machine can take. It can be a simultaneous TGA and DSC sensor or TGA and DTA sensor or just the DTA sensor. 
it's telling no communication to host PC because we haven't started the software to show you the crucibles these are different types of crucibles these are the alumina crucible 70 milliliter alumina crucibles that we use for most of our analysis the fresh crucibles these are the used ones after we run them one time we just keep it separate and then before we reuse it we clean this used crucible with acetone or alcohol in ultrasonic cleaner and then we fire the crucibles thousand degree to remove any residues and then bring it down to room temperature and then we can reuse these alumina crucibles many times you can use the crucibles with lead but since we are letting the moisture of the carbon dioxide evaporate we don't put a lead but you can also do with lead or without lead these are the aluminum crucible the metal crucible as opposed to ceramic crucible and this aluminum crucible also comes with lead and that lead is sealed cold sealed on the crucible by that sample press so this is one showing the aluminum crucible is sealed with the lead so basically to use this crucible you fill the crucible with the sample and then that sample goes inside the crucible goes inside you put an open lead and then it goes there and then you press with the press it goes like that and then it seals the crucible with the lead we made a small hole on the lead to release the moisture this hole is made with this needle you pinch a hole there also there is a needle in the robot which can also make the hole before loading the sample you can manually pierce it or it can be automatically pierced with the needle in the robot but we don't do uh, the alumina crucible, aluminum crucible mainly because it goes up to 600 degrees since the carbonates decomposes around 650 to 850 degree temperature range above the melting point of the aluminum we don't use the aluminum crucible for high temperature runs we use alumina crucibles and alumina crucibles can go up to 1100 degrees which we need and that's why we use mostly aluminum crucible alumina crucible to do both the TGA and DSC run here are the sensors that I was talking about we have more sensors these are TGA DTA sensor which is currently used in the unit to show you how it looks this is the TGA DTA sensor which has a platinum support and there are two positions one for the reference crucible and one for the crucible with the sample so we put an empty reference crucible of alumina all the time and then we add the sample crucible in this position so it determines the differential amount of heat energy absorbed between the reference crucible and the sample crucible for DSC purposes this is a brand new TGA DTA crucible also you can have a TGA DSC sensor in the TGA DSC sensor instead of a platinum base it uses a ceramic alumina base again one position for the reference crucible one position for the sample crucible the difference between these two it determines the TGA curve and it gives the DTG curve as well as DSC curve same thing this one this one has four thermocouples this one has six thermocouples for TGA and DSC measurements both these sensors give TGA DTG and DSC scans of a sample simultaneously these are the extra alumina crucibles aluminum crucibles I'm sorry these are the metal crucibles so 
and these are the calibration standards we always calibrate the machine before we do a run and calibration is done these are the lead that I was talking about to go on top of the alumina crucible and the calibration is done with indium zinc aluminum and gold these four standards are used for calibration we do the calibration regularly to make sure the machine is running properly before we start putting our samples there are some also the crucible box that comes with the unit which shows the different types of metal crucible and ceramic crucible and this is a holder which I also have here for loading the sample and unloading the sample the needles and this is a toolbox which comes also with the unit which is different tools so to run a sample what we do we usually use small containers small here it shows different vials we use to load our sample we give the CNC project number for each sample that we run and we keep the powder sample we usually we pulverize the sample to pass number 50, number 50 sieve finer than number 50 sieve and then we take the powder and load in the crucible which I'll show you how we do so here we have different standards that we run the like coarse sand calcite, dolomite, gypsum, blue site these are different standards then we also mix different standards to create our own standards to run so we know the known amount of mineral added and we determine by TGA or DSC the amount coming to get a good match between the known standard and the results before we run, uh, run the unknown so to start the software, this Metal Toledo has a very sophisticated software called STAR software and these are the manual for the STAR system, the TGA DSC STAR system, TGA software and it also comes with a fantastic book called Thermal Analysis in Practice which describes the theoretical part of this unit, the thermal analysis principles, how to do TGA and DSC. There's also a good book called Thermal Analysis of Construction Materials, which talks about all these techniques applicable to cement, concrete. Differential Thermal Analysis of Minerals and Rocks. So these are some good books to do TGA and DSC that we do. So to run a sample, first we load an alumina crucible. We take an alumina crucible, we first load the crucible, empty crucible, inside. There is one sample from the last run we did. We remove the sample. As I said, there are 34 positions, and they go from position 1 is 101 up to 134. That's how they go in the software. And this sample tray stays there. It can be removable. And once the sample loads, the furnace opens, and the sample goes inside. To show you how it looks, you press the furnace. Once you press the furnace, then it opens. Once the furnace opens, 
I can remove, I can move this tower like that. So you can see here the sensor that I was talking about, the TGA SDTA sensor with the platinum support and you can see there is a reference crucible empty alumina crucible sitting in the middle that always stays there in the middle and the robot will bring the sample crucible in this position and then there are some ceramic discs to control the weight and the purge gas the ultra pure nitrogen gas comes through this tube in the sensor to flush the system with the nitrogen and the furnace is inside the balance is this side the right side the furnace is in the left side it moves out and then it comes back to enclose the sample after the sample comes the reference crucible always stays there but to close the furnace you press the furnace button Once the furnace is closed, you can bring the robot down. It stays like that. So to load a sample, first we have to load the empty crucible to get the weight of the empty crucible. Then we'll tear it and then we load the sample and take the weight again. We start with the initial weight and then the weight changes occur with controlled heating. So this goes in position one and there are three rods which picks up the crucible and drops to the sample position in the sensor. So to start the thermal analysis software we go to the star E software We enter the password, username, then it starts the software. So the star E modules open where you have the routine editor and it gives a green bar at the bottom to tell it's in the power safe mode. It, 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 the software finds the robot. Once the software uh, communicates with the robot, the furnace opens, the three rods of the robot goes down to make sure there is no sample sitting there. And you can see inside here, when the robot goes inside and try to see if there is any sample or not. It sees there is no sample. So the furnace closes. It's a pretty smart system. It sees there is no no sample, nothing. So it's ready for the first sample loading. And there is a method. We set up a method to do the thermal analysis. And the method shows. So you go to the routine editor. Once you go to the routine editor, it shows the method. We are now going to create a new method. We are going to open our method. Our method is TGA 1100 blank subtraction method. What it does, it, it already knows we ran a blank sample and it subtracts the result of the blank sample against the actual sample. And this method, if we open it, it shows that we are using the alumina crucible 70 milliliter and it will go from 30 degrees, the ambient temperature, 30 degrees to 1100 degree at 10 degree Kelvin per minute rate, the heating will be done. 
and here we give a name of the sample that we are analyzing we will be running a sample from a CMC project this is a sample about a historic motor that we will be analyzing with this TGA DSC method it's a historic motor, a pigmented motor that we'll be analyzing. So we have to give a sample name. We give our CMC project. After we insert the CMC project, we don't insert the weight because the balance will determine the weight. We give the position 1, 101 per the empty crucible is sitting and then we say send experiment once we say send experiment it shows up under the experiment performed screen where it's a in progress we want to reset it and we want to add the weight under weight in auto mode first we are weighing the pan the empty pan the empty crucible and we say okay so once we say okay then the three rods of the robot will pick up the crucible see it opens up the furnace opens up the crucible at the position one will go behind beneath the rod and the rod will pick up the crucible the rod picks up the crucible and then it drops it to the sample position as you can see it drops in the sample position I shouldn't say drops it rather gently places the crucible in the sample position and then it comes up and then the furnace closes and now the balance is a very precision balance it goes to four decimal point in the milligram to determine the weight of the empty crucible Once it determines the weight of the empty crucible, the furnace opens and the robot goes down and picks up the empty crucible. It goes down and then it picks up and then it places at the position 1. And then the furnace closes. And then it's going to show up the pan weight in the pan weight column is 0 0.0000 pretty soon here. It's showing up 174.1080 milligram that's the weight it calculated of the empty crucible so once we know the empty crucible weight the software will subtract that from the sample plus crucible weight so now to put the sample we take a wax paper and then we carefully we have a card tweezer we use that to pick up the empty crucible 
and we place the crucible on a wax paper. Then we take a funnel. This funnel will make sure that there is no flow of the sample above the crucible. The funnel is placed right in the middle, like that. So that way when we pour the sample, sample stays inside the crucible. It doesn't come out. That's why this funnel is used. And we use this spatula, the micro spatula, small spatula we use to load the sample. One side is pointed, another side is curved. So first we make sure we mix the sample thoroughly. So it's a homogeneous sample. We get a homogeneous representative sample. After we mix it thoroughly, we take the spatula and we put, pick a very little sample, not much, just a little sample. We load it in the crucible. That's too much. Just a little. You need like 30, 40, 50 milligram. That's it. When so the sample is loaded, make sure we clean the spatula. When the sample is loaded, the small plastic vial where we keep about a gram of sample. Then we carefully pick up the funnel and we make sure this funnel is clean for the next sample. We just blow some air to remove any dust, any powder. Then we tap it just a little to make sure the sample is inside. And you can see the whole crucible is not filled. There is still some 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 top of the crucible. We don't fill all the way to the top. Just three quarter, about three quarter of the height of the crucible. Once the sample is loaded in the crucible, we place the sample and the crucible in the position one again at 101. So now we go to the row of the sample, we right click, weigh in auto. Now it's going to take the weight of the sample. We say OK. Once we say OK, It picks up the crucible and the sample again. The furnace opens. It carefully, gently places the sample in the sample position of the sensor. An alumina crucible is good to use against the platinum support of the sensor. Platinum uh, alumina crucible is not good. Aluminum crucible is not good against platinum support because metal metal contact especially um, you cannot go beyond 600 degree the melting point of aluminum that's why we use the alumina crucible we can safely use it up to 1100 degree centigrade temperature so now it's weighing the sample and the crucible and it's going to subtract the crucible weight and it will list the sample sample weight. From the previous runs, you can see we use about 55, 45, 65, 30 to 60 milligram of sample per 70 milliliter of alumina crucible that we load.
each run takes about hour and a half, about 90 minutes it takes at 10 degree Kelvin per minute. It goes from 30 degree to 1100 degrees centigrade. So once we load multiple samples, it runs overnight. We load the sample at the end of the day and the morning when we come, the, the report is there. So for um, two, 12 or 13 samples, it takes about a day to run the samples. And there is a chiller which chills the, which cools the balance, the furnace. And that chiller is a polyscience chiller. It runs continuously, 24-7 this chiller runs to keep the system cold. So here is the sample weight. It calculated the sample weight. So the sample weight is there. So now we just say start. Once we say start, then the experiment screen opens. It shows the weight in milligram versus minute, how long it will run, and it says it's going to run 1.47 hour, about hour and a half to two hours per sample. And it's uh, going to insert some temperature, which is 30 degree. And it also shows on the touch screen where it shows the temperature is rising. So it will wait until it goes to 30 degrees. Once it goes to insert some temperature of 30 degrees, it picks up the sample and load it. The software has, we have the data, we have CMC number, we have the sample number. And while this software running, when the experiment starts, I'm going to show you how we create the report from a previously run sample. So the robot is ready to pick up the sample. The, the furnace is opening. Picking up the crucible with the sample. So there is a reference crucible empty and the sample crucible with sample. And furnace is closing. And now the heating cycle will start. As soon as it reaches 30 degrees, the plot will start developing and it turns to red, the bar turns from green to red, indicating it's going to the start temperature. So usually for hydrous minerals and the hydrous phases like in Portland cement paste, the calcium silicate hydrate, the free water, the hydrate water, they start dehydrating, dehydroxylation of those phases starts at the early temperature range. There is a list of different temperature range where different phases decomposes from 30 to 60 degrees, the free water remove and then around 50 to 250 degree range calcium silicate hydrate dehydrate 100 to 200 degrees range gypsum and etrinite the sulfate phases decomposes then brucite magnesium hydroxide dehydroxylate at 300 to 450 degree range portlandite the calcium hydroxide component of cement hydration 
decomposes, dehydrated at 400 to 600 degree range, magnesite decarbonates 500 to 700 degree range, quartz, the quartz sand undergo alpha to beta polymorphic transition at 573 degree, where the DST curve shows a endotherm at 573 degree, a phase transition at 573 degree, then calcite De decarbonates. The fine grained calcite decarbonates around 600 to 700 and coarsely crystalline calcite decar decarbonate at 650 to 850 degree. So these are the different temperature from low end to the high end where different hydrous, sulfate and carbonate phases decomposes. And every time there is a decomposition it occurs as an endotherm which means it liberates the heat during the, during the decomposition. And the endotherm shows up as a downward peak on the, on the plot. So when it starts the plot, it shows the weight changes. And when there is a significant weight change, it gives the downward endotherm with increasing temperature, different phases dehydrate and decarbonate at different temperature and shows up as the characteristic endotherm in the TGA plot. And when you take a first derivative of TGA plot, which is the DTG plot, which clearly shows the peak where the weight changes occur in the TGA. I'm going to show you that once this experiment starts, it's telling settling and then measurement started because it already reached the 30 degree starting temperature. Let's say measurement started. So pretty soon you will see a red line of the TGA curve as well as the DSC both will show up. This actually shows the heat flow, the DSC curve. This actually shows the TGA, the weight change with temperature, the heat flow change with temperature. So TGA and DSC curves are show side by side. So as the experiment progresses you will see both curves how they changes. And they started. You can see the red plot right here. So now while this experiment is running, it's going to run for 90 minutes. Let me show you how, let me show you how uh, I determine how I do the processing after the scan is done. I can simply minimize this window. And to open a previous sample, that previously run sample, you go to evaluation window, and in the evaluation window each scan will show up as a curve like I opened the curve and I'm going to show you a standard we ran. We create standard as I was telling. Here for example I have a standard with 70% quartz, 20% Portland cement paste I added having a water cement ratio of 0.5. It was cured for 7 days. I used that paste, 20% of that paste then I added 5% calcite and 5% brucite. So this is a standard I created to replicate a mortar sample, a masonry mortar sample. A mortar usually have coarse sand, cement paste, calcite, and if it is a dolomitic lime, it has brucite. So we created a standard with the different components, different minerals, and let me show you when I open that, it shows the, the different plots. The black one is the TGA plot. The blue dashed line is the DTG, the first derivative of the TGA plot. As you can see, 
a change in weight in the TGA plot shows up clearly as a peak, as a downward peak in the DTG plot. Whereas the dotted red line is the DSC plot. So the black one is TGA plot, the dotted red one is DSC plot, the dashed blue one is DTG plot. You can see the DTG plot and DSC plot are more or less similar. They both show the, the downward peak, but DTG shows up clearly than DSC. Here this peak corresponds to the weight change due to dehydration of calcium silicate hydrate. Then a small bump comes from dehydration of sulfate, the etrinite, in the Portland cement paste. Then the brucite that we added, that brucite dehydrated, dehydroxylation of brucite happened around 400 degrees centigrade temperature. And you can clearly see a peak in the DTG carb from brucite dehydroxylation as well as in the DSC carb. Next one is around 450 degree, 400 to 450 degree, where calcium hydroxide dehydrated, clearly shown by the DTG carb as well as the DSC carb. And quartz gives the alpha beta polymorphic transition around 573 degree. It shows up in the DSC carb only. Since this is not a dehydration or phase change except polymorphic transition, it shows up in the DSC carb with this downward peak. Then the calcite shows a beautiful decarbonation endotherm with a downward the DTG carb. DSC also shows up again. DTG shows clearly. Correspond to this drop in the weight from decarbonation. Then no significant changes occur except some polymorphic transition of calcium silicate phase occurs there and shows up in DTG. So these are the endotherms corresponding to the hydration of calcium silicate hydrate, loss of water of etrinite, brucite, calcium hydroxide, polymorphic transition of quartz, decomposition of calcite. All the phases that I added in the standard showed up nicely in the plot. So to show how the amount, the, the quantitative amount, quantitative determination, what I do is, usually I don't give the, the data on the plot. To remove the cluttering of the plot, we keep the plot like that. And then I go to an Excel. And in the Excel, for example, the one that I did, shows up here the particular sample that I ran is this one 70% quartz, 20% Portland cement paste 5% calcite, 5% brucite here I'm showing you the TGA data, DTG data in blue, and DSC data in red. And as you can see, for example, I'll show you how I calculate the individual minerals. Like I had 70% quartz, DSC gave 72.3% quartz. I added 5% calcite. The average calcite from TGA, DTG, and DSC came 4.8. Pretty good match to my actual amount that I added. Brucite, I added 5% brucite in my standard and the average brucite content determined from TGA, DTG and DSC came 4.58. So I got a good recovery of the actual amount added in my standard sample. So I got 4.6% blue side, I got 4.8% calcite, and about 72% quartz. And then calcium hydroxide and etrinite came, and calcium silicate hydrate, they came from 20% paste that added. So how we got this quantitative 
values of different minerals. What we did is we get the evaluation plot, we go back to the evaluation plot and say for example to determine the amount of quads what we do we collect we, we choose the area where the coarse transition occurred and then we maximize the polymorphic transition the DSC scan with this with this zoom and then we go from one end to other of that red dotted DSC scan of the cores and then we integrate that area and the way we integrate that area is we do control F6 which integrate the area and it gives a normalized value the, the main parameter which is of interest is the normalized value of this area 3. 0 0.08 joule and that value we take against the normalized value of pure quads pure quads if we run pure quads I'll show you that so that's how we integrate each one then we go back again bring the DSC curve this side we usually keep the DSC curve no this is the TGA axis we bring the DSC axis this side and we bring the TGA axis this side and that this one is the DTG axis so to show how we got that so once I got the parameter those parameters shows up in Here. This is where the parameters are, which shows 72.3% quartz. So for each phase from the characteristic endotherm, we get the weight change, weight loss, and DTG, and then DSC. So for quartz, for example, if I want to show you the pure quartz, when we did the pure quartz, this is the RAN for pure quartz. Pure quartz gave a normalized value of 4.3. 4.3 is the normalized value for pure quartz. So when we have a mixture, we get a normalized value for quartz DSC 3.11. We divide 3.11 by 4.3 times 100. That gives 72.3% quartz. So that's how this quartz content is calculated. Same way we can get like brucite. Brucite we get the weight change from TGA. We get the brucite content. How we get the brucite content? Here for example, this is the step horizontal drop of weight in the brucite and this is the step tangential drop in weight of brucite. To show that, if I go back to that curve again, what we do is we block to determine the blue side. We go from one end of that. If you concentrate on the dashed blue DTG curve, we go from one end to the other of the downward peak. We get the area covered by the blue dashed line, which shows the DTG curve for the blue side endotherm. Once we know the area, then we get the TDGA curve, the black one. We get that curve, we highlight that curve. And then we say step tangential that gives the value of the weight change, the mass change at that range. And it shows the step tangential. Then we can also do that by step horizontal and step tangential. So we get two percentages, one from step horizontal and other it does by step tangential. So there are two modes of calculating the brucite content from TGA car. And those are the modes which are go which are included in that in that graph where we have step 
horizontal we got the blue side content and step tangential we got the blue side content so if I go back we remove those and the same way we can again cover the area of the weight change for blue side dehydroxylation and then once we cover the area if we want the integration of DTG curve we just choose that We choose the curve and then a control F6 give the integration of that area. And the same way we can choose the DSC curve, control F6 give the integration of the DSC curve in red. So we get the DSC integration, we get the DTG integration, then all we do is you control C to copy. Then we go to the Excel, and in the Excel, we do the Control V to add that. So that's how from Control C to Control V, we copy the data from the scan to individual. So that's how the step horizontal TGA data come step tangential TGA data com, DTG data com, and DSC data com. And they're all color coded. And then to calculate the actual content of blue side from the weight loss, this is the percent loss in weight. To calculate, you simply multiply that by a factor 3.24, which is a stoichiometric factor for blue side dehydration. That's basically the ratio of the molecular weight of blue side to the molecular weight of water and MgO. That's how you get the stoichiometric factor, 3.24. You multiply that factor to the percent loss in weight, you get the blue side content. And same thing when we do the normalized value, we get the normalized value in DTG. We divide that, we multiply that by the same factor to get the blue side content when we do the DTG quantification of blue side. For DSC, we take the pure blue side value. Pure blue side is 980. We divide the normalized value of 44.92 divided by 980, we get the blue side content in the DSC. To show you, this is the pure blue side run. Here you can see the pure blue side. When we did the pure blue side, we ran it two times it gave the normalized value of 980. You can see 980. So that's what we use to calculate blue side content in other samples. This is a sample with 100% blue side. And the normalized value for DSC, we got 980. So if I go back to my mixture, in my mixture, the normalized value at the blue side dehydration is 44. So we get 44.92. 44.92 divided by 980 times 100, we get 4.58% blue side. So that's how the blue side content is determined from TGA, from DTG, and from DSC. Then I average from each one, we average the value, and that's the blue side content we use from TGA. DTG and DSC. So the same principle is applied to determine the calcite content, to determine the Portlandite content. So this is how the quantification of different hydrous carbonate sulfate phases are done from the TGA, DTG and DSC curve. So once the data is determined in the Excel, what we do is basically plot the data in here showing the actual plot of the mixture and then at the bottom we saw the data actual data many author put the result right on the curve i try to create a separate table for different data from tga dtg dsc at each temperature how each phase decomposes or undergo polymorphic transition so this is how the result is reported in our report we give the three scans, the TGA scan, DTG scan, DSC scan, and then the data at the bottom. 
and here I can show you this is a run we did for a gypsum sample all it had was gypsum and calcite it's a gypsum based roof deck you can see the main characteristic endotherm around 150 to 200 degree from decomposition of gypsum which is the main weight loss mass loss in the TGA curve then there is a little high, uh, bump from calcium silicate hydrate phase and then the main calcite decom de decarbonation give the characteristic endotherm of calcite decomposition. This is a gypsum based sample. This is the one I just showed of the mixture that we did. This is another mixture. So we do a lot of standards first. We run the standards to determine the quantitative amount of different phases that we are adding to make sure that what the thermal analysis gives gives a close match to the actual amount added. Everything done with the alumina crucible, 70 milliliter alumina crucible, no lead from 30 degree to 1100 degree range at 10 degree Kelvin per minute heating rate. This is a straight Portland cement paste, nothing else. It shows multiple endotherms from calcium silicate hydrate, from etrinite, from gypsum, from Portlandite, one after the other it shows up with the characteristic endotherm. This one is the brucite run that I was telling. When we did the pure brucite, we got a normalized value of around 980. That's what we used to determine the brucite content in the unknown sample. Here it shows the TG, DTG in blue dash, DSC in the red dot, and the black one is the TGA curve. Another run of brucite showing the characteristic endotherm. This is a 50% calcite and 50% dolomite. Shows the decarbonation temperature. Usually it gives the bump when you have a calcite dolomite mixture at the lower temperature end from dolomite decarbonation. This is the pure dolomite. It gives you two bump. This is pure calcite, 100% calcite. All you get is the decarbonation temperature. The recovery was around 98.8%. From TGA, DTG and DSC we got 98.8% recovery of the calcite that we used as a standard. Here you can separate the individual scar TGA, DSC, DTG separately. But I stopped doing this way because it makes the representation pretty clumsy. I decided not to give the data on the scan, rather give the data separately on the uh, below the plot as a table. So to show you some of the runs we did, again this is the data. Like this is a dolomitic lime mortar which shows you the brucite decarbonation, characteristic brucite decarbonation to determine the dolomitic line and then the calcite decarbonation with a tiny little peak from quartz because it has quartz sand. It shows as a small kink in the DSC curve. This sample had very little, 33% quartz, 32% calcite, the blue side came around 1%, 1.3% blue side. This is another one, another motor. It's a pointing motor we did, which was Portland cement and mostly Portland cement, little bit of dolomitic lime and quartz sand. Because of having a, this is similar to a type A cement lime motor. Type A Portland cement dolomitic lime motor. So here you can see calcium silicate hydrate and etrinite shows up from cement paste dehydration. Very characteristic peak for cement paste dehydration. Then dolomitic lime, the brucite came from dolomitic lime, give you this dehydroxylation around 350 degree. Portlandite, very clear peak for Portlandite from Portland cement paste. 
then quartz sand shows this kink again in the DSC scan then the calcite comes from carbonated lime matrix and, and, and carbonated cement paste and carbonated lime matrix. So these are very typical endotherms that a cement lime mortar shows. Same thing, another one. This one is a lime mortar, mostly a lime mortar. All you have is calcite from carbonated lime matrix, the main endotherm of the calcite, and then quartz from the quartz sand. And it also shows some Portlandite in the lime matrix. So this is how the data is represented. We give the scan of TGA, DSC, and then give the data at the bottom. And we do the quantitative calculation of different phases based on the amount detected in the TGA, DTG, and DSC scan. So that's how the data is presented in the report. That's how the data is calculated in the Excel. We calculate the data and then we copy this and paste in the in the PowerPoint presentation and that's how the data is shown in the evaluation screen of the Metler Toledo Star E software that's how the data is shown so to go back to the actual run that I was doing there is the run that I was running. You can see how the data is forming. There is not much change happened. If I double click, it shows the temperature axis as well as the time in minute. You can see it has already heated up to around 300 degree, which you can see in the touch screen is 282 degree so far. And nothing happened that much except a big bump from a phase transition happened in that range in the DSC curve, but not much drop in the TGA. This will run for 90 minutes and then it will provide the data and the data as I showed will show up in the evaluation screen. Here I'm going to show you one run we did before of a similar mortar, a pigmented mortar where we had brucite from dolomitic lime, portlandite from lime, quartz from quartz sand, and calcite from carbonated lime matrix, calcium carbonate, carbonated lime matrix. This is the typical endotherm that a lime mortar shows. Usually we run this overnight with multiple samples and in the morning when we come the results are there once the result comes we basically open one by one start evaluating each one look at each look at each data look at each data individually and then we look for the endotherms and then we decide where the left and right bracket for each endotherm is and once we determine the brackets we select the area once we select the area then we basically choose the individual curve and get the results like that once we get the individual curves individual endotherms result we copy and paste in the excel so that's how we determine each one, each phases decomposition and the corresponding quantitative amount. Let this experiment run. So this is how we do our thermal analysis. When we clean an old sample, when an old sample is done, we basically take the sample and we blow compressed air to remove the sample after we remove the sample from compressed air we have to clean it in alcohol 
it ultrasonically. We keep it in the used crucible box. These are all used one. We keep it there for cleaning. Once we have enough that we clean those samples, we clean those ultrasonically and then we heat it around 900,000 degree in a muscle furnace to remove any residue and then we can reuse that again. So that's pretty much it, how we do our thermal analysis. It's going to run and then you see how we get the evaluation part done. We usually keep this cover and let it run. Thank you.